I'm Scott Al Miller. This is my life living in Latin America, and today we're recording in rather a lot of rain because it's that season and I need to get some episodes recorded. For a lot of you, when you're looking at maybe coming to Nicaragua, one of the things you might be interested in is learning Spanish, maybe from a teacher, maybe a deep dive course, maybe some immersion. So a lot of people ask when and where and how is it best to learn Spanish in Nicaragua and is Nicaragua a good country for learning Spanish in? So we're gonna talk about why it may not be your top choice, but what your options are and how it might work here right after that bump. of you may be watching the show and wondering if Nicaragua is a great place to come and learn a new language. What a great reason to be doing some tourism, maybe living abroad just for a few years, or maybe just going on a vacation and taking a couple weeks and you want to deep dive into some first person one on one learning. Well, that's fantastic as a concept and a wonderful thing to do a great reason to travel and a great way to add meaning and purpose to the travel giving you reason to get out of bed in the morning, go to specific things and to engage people in a specific way and to give you the power to engage a lot of people, even if you're doing it for just for a few weeks, obviously a little bit longer is better months or years, you're gonna get a lot farther. But doing immersion where you have a direct one on one conversations with people takes you so far so fast and really uh, helps you grow just as a person, if nothing else, but really gives you an ability to interact with a new society that you're checking out. And if you're evaluating a region, for example, you're thinking about moving to Latin America, and you want to uh, be able to evaluate it even better than certainly learning Spanish, assuming you don't already speak Spanish. Uh, or Portuguese, if that's the part of Latin America that you're looking at moving to, then by learning the language, you're going to be able to engage more at the grocery store, go out to the bar and engage more, go to restaurants and talk to people, sit in the park and suddenly have conversations with the old guys playing chess, whatever your example insert here. But by having the language, you're going to just have that power. And by taking classes, you're going to have someone that you're talking to. And it's going to just naturally cause conversations with them. It's going to give you just so many connections in almost all cases. It's going to help you a lot. So what a great concept. Should you be looking at doing this in Nicaragua? Is this the place you're going to do it? Well, let's get into that. Is Nicaragua a good place for learning Spanish? And this is a question that comes up a lot. And the answer is a pretty quick and simple, not really with caveats. So first of all, if your goal is to learn Spanish for the purpose of eventually living in or doing business with Nicaragua specifically, then I think it's an obvious yes. Of course, you want to learn Nicaraguan Spanish with a Nicaraguan accent if Nicaragua is where you're going to be using it. So for me, learning Spanish in Nicaragua is a duh. Of course, that's where I want to learn it because that's where I'm going to speak it the most. But if you're looking for a general purpose Spanish, you don't live in Nicaragua, you're not going to live in Nicaragua, but you are interested in visiting it, of course, and you you want to be able to travel throughout the Spanish world, or you want to maybe move to Mexico or Spain or, or Argentina, then would Nicaragua be a great place to spend your time learning Spanish? And for those purposes, in general, from a linguistic standpoint, the answer is no. And why is this? So a couple of reasons. The fundamental reason is because Nicaragua is using a colonial Spanish, a very old version of Spanish that nowhere else in the world has clung to. So because of this, Nicaraguan Spanish is a little bit quirky compared to much of the Spanish speaking world. It's just an older version, which is a little bit confusing for English speakers because we often associate older versions of English with what's spoken in England. But in reality, the United States speaks an older version of English than England does. Uh, so it's a little bit inverted from what people imagine just because of the nature of languages over time. But America has held on to a bit of a colonial structure to their language where England has moved on from it. And being the older country, it's actually more likely to drift than the new ones as counterintuitive as that may seem. So Nicaragua is one of these places that was colonized a little over 500 years ago. And when Spanish was introduced here, it was quite old by modern accounts. I mean, half a millennium old. That's actually a pretty long time in linguistic uh, uh, circles. If you were to look at, at English 500 years ago in London, it would be extremely difficult for you to understand. It would be quite different than it is today. You would be able to pick up most things, but it would be dramatically different. You'd, you'd sense it in every single thing. Plus, the accents would be extreme. Nicaragua, luckily, is not that dramatic, and it does have contact with the outside world, so it still has drifted, but it has a lot more colonial hold, a lot more old structure than the majority of Spanish languages. So this is 
almost like a time capsule of language, and you will notice that. So, so learning the uh, quirky nature of Old Spanish here is probably not the best way to have a more universal Spanish capability. Number two, Nicaragua is a Vos country. This means that unlike the majority, but not the entirety, of the Spanish-speaking world, they don't use the to form of you, which is the informal and is generally what's accepted and what's taught in most American schools and most schools everywhere in the Spanish speaking world, but instead they use vos. Now, of course, most Nicaraguans are going to understand more universal Spanish because that's what they hear on TV and in, on the internet and stuff, but it's not what they speak in day to day. So if you're trying to overhear conversations or you're trying to have casual conversations with people, you may be shocked to have a lot of the words that you learned in regular Spanish from Spanish class not being used. And a bunch of verb conjugations that are different than you're used to. And they may be only slightly different, but they're different enough that you can't necessarily identify what is being said because these nuances are how you identify who is speaking and about what, and having ones that are interjected on a regular basis that are not easily identifiable is super confusing. It just makes everything much harder. Now, again, if your goal is to learn a Voss Spanish, that part isn't such a big deal, but it is very rare that that is used. It's mostly used in Argentina and in Nicaragua and a little bit in El Salvador, and they all use it a little bit differently, so that's important to understand as well, that it's not 100% universal. Here in Nicaragua, and this is a little bit of my personal opinion from what I hear, but I hear very often a blend of the Voss uh, uh, word with some of the two based conjugations, which is problematic because you aren't always sure what's being said or when you're supposed to do it. For example, I often hear two used possessively, but if you're using correct Voss, it would be vuestro being used. So that's a little bit that catches you. But if you're in Argentina, you're not going to hear that in my experience. You're just going to hear the vuestro all the time. Also in written Spanish, here I see the two and there I see the vuestro, but vuestro is correct even here. So very confusing and you can see that the language is starting to shift but very slowly but it's still very hard. Now again if you're looking for learning the Voss form then it shouldn't be a big deal but that is very rare that that's what you want to learn unless you want to learn it as an addendum rather than your basics. Most people want to learn two as the basic that's what you're going to use in Spain. That's what you're going to use in Mexico. That's what you're going to use in Guatemala. That's what you're going to use in Panama and Costa Rica, Colombia, and, and almost everywhere. So the, the huge majority and all the people who do speak with Voss do understand too. So it never puts you at a, a level where you can't, under, you can't be understood. Um, it's, just, it's just this extra complexity uh, that can make hearing the language and picking it up a little bit harder. And if you're doing things like Duolingo, they completely ignore the Voss and Vosotros options. And so, of course, they're very rarely used. Uh, so those are things you won't get the same education on. And I have seen very few tools that ever include those. So I don't know if like Rosetta Stone or anyone like that has added that, but most places never do. And so just many fewer resources for learning that, which makes it not just an extra thing to learn, but extra hard to learn uh, in addition to everything else. Plus, when you're here, people will flip back and forth. Some people can speak with the two with absolutely no effort, and they'll use that because they see you as a foreigner. And so sometimes you'll get conversations that just shift back and forth, and then you'll talk to someone else, and they'll go right to Voss. And then some people use Voss, but, but kind of loosely, and some people use it really stringently. It's all over the place. So that just makes this a little bit harder for every day. If your goal is to go to the bar and hear people speaking, it's going to be much more complex than some other locations. Also, the Nicaragua accent is not the easiest to learn. It is not one of the hard accents, so let's be clear. It is a relatively clear accent, and the speed at which people speak is relatively slow. There's certainly a lot of Mexico that uses a lot more slang, a lot more fast talking, a lot more slurring stuff together. There are regions that get really, really hard to understand. So we're not saying that Nicaragua is the worst place to learn Spanish, especially in this regard, but the accent is relatively strong and it will cause some dramatic problems. And a couple things that I want to explain about that. One is that the end of words is dropped quite often. So the S at the end of a word will easily not be pronounced. And so we often say things like, uh, we just had a, a, a video on this. We say audio instead of adios. And so or we say bueno, bueno dia instead of buenos dias. And that is a little bit difficult because there's things sometimes you need to identify with that sound or more importantly as someone who is learning a language and your brain is really quickly trying to take what you're here put it into you know written spanish in your brain and and convert it and get it out and then you're like 
wait, I took so long trying to figure out what they said, I missed what was being said. It's not that you can't understand them, but you, you, you spend more time calculating the language. Eventually, once you hear it, then you're, you're gonna be fine, but it just makes that initial learning that much harder, so you're gonna take longer to get to the same place. It's a little bit like the Voss problem, it just makes everything harder to hear. Casually hearing uh, people speak on the street, just that much less clear. Same thing that Bs and Vs are 100% the same uh, letter here. Uh, double Ls and Ys, 100% the same thing. There's no uh, audio clues uh, to separate those things. A, a single R is often pronounced so close to a D that I, even when people say it carefully to me, I can't always differentiate if there's an R or a D in what they're saying. Uh, so a, a bit of those things are just uh, accent problems that make learning just that much harder that, that you're going to hear things and be like, I just cannot write down what I think you said. I cannot identify what sounds you can't search on words because you, you just, you lose that, uh, uh, those linguistic clues. So that's a, that's a pretty big thing um, that adds up. The last major thing is that uh, Nicaraguan Spanish is a spoken language, not a written language, meaning they don't have strict written rules for Spanish as it is used. Now this goes back to the uh, double L's and Y's are sometimes used interchangeably. The B's and V's are constantly used interchangeably. And this goes beyond just normal words. You could take words like vivir and bebir and see how they can basically sound exactly the same or so close that you can't tell them apart. One is written with a B, one is written with a V. But uh, when you're writing those, people may write them in either way, making it impossible to identify which is which, because any given letter could be anything. You have so few clues to figure out um, what word may be being used. And even places like here in Sutiava, uh, they can be spelled with a B or a V. Both are completely legitimate because it was a name from before the Spanish language. So there is no historic basis for either letter. They're equally used because it's simply a sound that is being replicated, nothing else. Uh, the same goes for human names. So as an example, I have a friend Wilbur, uh, or at least that's how we would say it in English, but here it's more uh, of a Wilver sound. That B is generally going to sound more like a V than a B. And remember, the same letter. So there's somewhere in the middle is kind of where they meet. He will randomly spell his name with a B or a V. The rest is the same, always pronounced the same. Which one you use is truly random. And people, when you ask them, how do you spell your name? They're like, whatever, right? They don't have this tie to the written form being a formal, important thing. It is what you say that matters, not what you write. And so that it just becomes very, very difficult. I've known businesses that have written their name four different ways on their own business themselves, right? Not it, it, like, like even people themselves don't identify with their own name having a specific spelling in many cases. And so that is an entire cultural thing of spelling being this very loose concept that we don't experience other places that I'm aware of. Uh, and that means that anything that is being written could be very, very difficult for you to interpret until you already speak a bit of English, uh, a bit of Spanish. I also have noticed that things like spaces between words very often don't exist because, again, their phrases and stuff are being learned by audio and not by written. So in, in the United States, for example, uh, if you're going to learn a new phrase, there's a really good chance you're going to see it written down as soon as or before you ever try to speak it. If someone's teaching you something, Thing to say. They're going to write it somewhere so you can see what they're saying and then they're going to say it and so you have this connection. But in Nicaragua, most people are learning things without ever having seen it and may never really see it in a formal setting. They may not see it in books, right? People are very rarely buying books. They're not often going out and reading stuff. They're just hearing it on television, hearing it from people speaking. And then people are writing to each other. Of course, people are on social media and stuff and they're, and they're talking in text, but then they're seeing other Nicaraguans who have also not formally been taught those things writing to each other. So you may see words like, I'll use a really common example. Someone asks you how you are, you, you, you know, how the day is going. You say, esta bien, right? And you'll see this written as a single word. In, in real formal written Spanish, it is esta bien. It's very clear, but it is just written esta bien as one thing with all one word, E-S-T-A-B-I-E-N. And when you first see that, you're like, what is this? This is a native Spanish speaker. They must know what they're writing. And then you look at it and look at it and you're like, wait a minute, they're just saying it's okay. You have to 
put a space between the words and then you realize it's two separate words. Now, maybe the language is going to evolve where these things become a single word. There's certainly examples in English where this has happened over time. We're seeing this happen here, but not in the rest of the Spanish speaking world. So that gets very uh, confusing. And especially when you run words together and you change the beginnings of words, this is much more uh, confusing. I have seen um, words run together where the first word is a, a name and the second word is something that should start with a double L, but they write it with a Y and they merge them together and take out the space between them. So you can't identify any of the words very easily to get the sound to figure out what they're trying to say. And the best thing you can do is pronounce the whole thing out loud and try it a couple different ways and see if you can hear some words being said. But if you aren't familiar enough with Spanish to hear those words, there's no way to put it through like Google Translate or anything because it can't find the words either because they're not spelled right and they're not spaced right, so it doesn't have any clues to figure out where the words are. That written Spanish being so loose and uh, informal makes learning Spanish as a second language extremely difficult. Of course, if you're learning it as a first language, you're learning it from people just saying it. You hear people say it. You don't really have to think about those things, uh, and it's not the problem that you perceive, but if you're learning it as a second language and you're building off of your first language, generally we use written quite a bit to do that, that's going to be very confusing. Plus, if you're trying to read Spanish on a regular basis, it'll always be written one way, and then you do things in, in Nicaragua, and then suddenly they're writing it in ways you've never seen, different spacing, different letters, and and, and it can be super confusing. Plus, a lot of people write without their enyes. They don't use the, the, the same formal question marks. There's a lot of things that we think we have to do that are kind of left by the wayside in a lot of communications. And it all adds up to a very confusing situation, making it quite difficult to learn for a new learner. There are some really strong positives to why you might want to choose Nicaragua, so I don't want this to be all doom and gloom, and I don't want any of you to think that the language here in Nicaragua is so hard that you are going to want to reconsider moving to Nicaragua because it's going to be so difficult to learn. It's not like that. It's just when it comes to picking the ideal place to learn a language, it's got some really obvious caveats that make it less of an ideal thing if your goal is this universal Spanish-speaking world. But again, if Nicaraguan Spanish is your goal, none of these things matter because these are the things you're going to have to know. They're not so much harder than regular Spanish. It's just so much harder if that's not the thing you want to learn, right? It's it's a question of if the thing you want to learn is Nicaraguan Spanish, then great, it's not going to be that hard. If the thing you want to learn is Mexican Spanish and you wonder if Nicaraguan Spanish is the right path to getting there, no, Mexican Spanish is the right path to getting there. I don't know, that's just how it is, right? Learn the thing you want to know, not something near to it, right, as the best path. Uh, now, if you just want Spanish in a very general sense, right, and, it, and it's just because you want to learn a language, you want to engage somewhere, then it's going to be kind of six of one, half dozen of another, not a big deal. Still not the absolute easiest place to learn Spanish, but it won't be that big of a deal because you're not then going to try to apply it to another region. But why might there be positives to Nicaragua as a place? Well, there's some obvious ones. We talk about this all the time. One, Nicaragua is super safe, one of the safest places in all of Latin America. Now, I was just in Argentina. They are also incredibly safe. Actually, technically, for at least from all the books, they are safer than Nicaragua. Now, again, both are so safe. This is not stuff you have to worry about at all, but Technically, they're a little bit more safe. However, is Argentina a great place to learn a language? Absolutely not, unless you want to learn Argentinian Spanish, because while they speak Castellano, it is accented to such an extreme degree that many Spanish speakers struggle to understand them. Again, nothing wrong. It's their own version of the language, but it is far from neutral, much farther from neutral than Nicaraguan is. Nearly all the caveats we gave about Nicaragua will be magnified in Argentina. They still use the Vos and more formally. They have an accent that is much stronger than the Nicaraguan one. They speak fast, at least compared to Nicaragua, and their uh, usage of the language is even more influenced, but in a modern way, whereas Nicaragua is influenced in an archaic way. So the same really veered off, and I, uh, my personal opinion is likely they have a lot of Portuguese influence, but that is just my guess. I've not done any research on that, but you hear something very different in their language, and it is hard. So just because they're safe alone is not a great reason, but Nicaragua and Argentina represent some really safe countries where you just don't have to worry about danger pretty much at all. So that's a consideration for people, especially if, you know, you have nothing else to go on. What would make a positive about Nicaragua? Well, it's incredibly safe. That's obviously a great positive. Also, Nicaragua is very, very inexpensive. It may not be the cheapest country in all of the Americas, but it's really close to it. You're only off by a few percentage points. It is within that group of countries like Colombia who are competing for the absolute rock bottom cost of living, which on its own, not a huge factor, but it's certainly not a negative. That's a great reason to consider Nicaragua. 
Also pretty high on that list is the fact that Nicaragua uses the U.S. dollar. It's not its primary currency, but it is a fully official currency. So should you be coming from the United States or someplace and you're familiar with U.S. dollars, you have banks in U.S. dollars, it's really easy to work in Nicaragua. If you're not, if you're moving full time, really not a big deal. But if you're coming for a temporary amount of time, just being able to work on the U.S. dollar is awfully handy. So there are benefits to that, but again, not a big deal. None of these things are, are you know, absolute must do's. None of them are showstoppers, but they all have their negatives and positives depending on what it is you're looking for. But at the end of the day, the reality is, is that Nicaragua is not the absolute ideal place to come to learn a language, and it's not probably in the top five. It is a middling country for learning Spanish. I would say the accent isn't that hard. The quirkinesses are not that difficult. It is in a, in a region with a relatively neutral accent that's not super strong. They don't speak super fast. So it's certainly not the worst country by any stretch whatsoever. But is it one you would pick specifically because its strong suit is being a language learning country? No. And because of that, there aren't that many language schools here in Nicaragua. You would have no problem finding a tutor, one-on-one -on -one help, online help. Uh, some schools do exist, but they won't be in every you know community. They won't be in every neighborhood. They won't be at every location. There used to be many more, but many have gone away. So while it can be done, it's not a business here in Nicaragua. There are countries where it is a big bit of their tourism infrastructure, and they have many schools in many different parts of the country around this where their country is just generally much better suited to being used as a linguistic location. So where are those? The places that I think are probably the best for learning Spanish overall. And I know that someone's going to say, why not Spain? And Spain would not be that bad. But in reality, not that much of the world speaks uh, traditional Spanish. They mostly speak Latin American Spanish. Of course, if your goal, again, is to live in Spain, then obviously learning it in Spain will do you the most good. That would behoove you the most. But if you're looking at a broader picture or time in Latin America, then Latin America is more alike than it is different for the most part compared to Spain, most part. Uh, so learning in Latin America is generally going to be your best bets, generally also going to be your lower cost, easier to deal with. But if you're coming from England or France, obviously Spain's right there. Uh, but if you're coming from North America, Latin America is going to be just way more convenient. Now, maybe you're coming from Europe and you want something a little bit more exotic or vice versa. You know, all those are fine. These are lots of options. We're just trying to come up with what is really the ideal place to learn Spanish. I would say that probably around number three is going to be El Salvador. Super safe, not very expensive, and their language is a lot more neutral than Nicaragua. Their accent is very easy, but they do use Voss some, and that means they just can't be your number one pick. That is a little bit of complexity that they're, anytime you hear it, it makes Spanish a little bit harder. So that's going to keep them from being a slam dunk. If you go out in El Salvador, you could be hearing that, and it could make things a little bit more difficult. And number two, I'm going to say Mexico, partially because it is the largest Spanish-speaking country anywhere, no matter how you slice or dice it. Um, except landmass, which of course is not a measurement of, of that kind of thing. And it is just absolutely huge with more than 100 million uh, native Spanish speakers. Their accent is relatively clear. They do use a lot of slang. That's a little bit of a negative. Um, they have some of their own quirky slang. Uh, they do speak a little bit on the fast side. Uh, but in general, Mexican Spanish is very influential into the United States and to many of the countries in Central America. So even if you're um, not going to be in Mexico, there's a really good chance that a lot of places are are going to get uh, a, bit, a bit of influence. They're going to be really used to hearing Mexican Spanish. They're going to see it on TV. They're going to hear it on the radio. They're going to hear it in music. And so there's just all these places where Mexican Spanish has this massive influence. Of course, it creates just so much of the media um, and, and, and political discourse and everything comes from Mexico uh, throughout the Spanish world. So that that's going to be just a great place to learn in general. And Mexico is a huge place. So you have just unlimited numbers of places to go. And of course, there's schools of all sorts. There's anything you ever want in Mexico, right? It being so large and affluent, they're going to have every possible resource. However, are they our number one pick? No, they're only our number two. And again, there may be countries that are actually better and I'm just not aware. Uh, but generally, we consider the number one place to be learning Spanish if your goal is a neutral Spanish and your purpose of your trip is to learn Spanish. You don't have other things driving you to a country. Of course, if there's reasons you want to be in Nicaragua and you're wondering if it's a good place to learn Spanish, go for it, right? If you're going to be in Mexico and, and you're wondering if it's okay, yeah, absolutely. You don't have to pick a place just because it's the absolute best for your Spanish. That's generally a weird reason to pick a country. But if you just really want to study Spanish and you want the absolute best way to get started, 
my understanding is the best place is going to be Guatemala. Why Guatemala? <clears throat> One, okay, the country is not as safe as Nicaragua, but it's not as dangerous as Mexico right now. It is easy to be in safe areas, however, so as a tourist or a language learner, you really have nothing to worry about. A little tiny bit of common sense is going to keep you completely safe. You don't have to worry about that there. It's just not how things work. Uh, two, it uses a relatively neutral accent. It's very easy to hear for people from nearly all of the Spanish-speaking world. It's not hard to speak in Guatemala, whereas Nicaragua, a little bit harder. Costa Rica, much harder, right? So th those things really do matter. You'd be surprised moving from country to country how quick you can be like, I thought I could speak Spanish and now I don't know what's going on at all. Yeah, Guatemala, if I go there from Nicaragua, I instantly speak twice as much Spanish. My own Spanish speaking level just explodes as soon as I'm in Guatemala. It makes everything that much easier. So that, re that from my own experience, is very real. Two, they don't use Vos. They use a very standard, simple, modern Spanish that is basically replicated throughout the world. So you're not going to have this skew that makes things more difficult for you. That is definitely important. Guatemala also uses a more formal written Spanish. So everything you can see on signs and everywhere is almost always going to be the standard as is dictated by the uh, the, the, the college in Spain. You're not going to be getting their own interpretation of Spanish spoken or written. Uh, and that, that for sure makes things a lot easier. It is also, uh, to the best of my knowledge, what Duolingo Spanish is based on. So every example you see there is going to be as close as you can get in most cases. They do do a couple things in uh, Duolingo to kind of give you a little bit broader perspective, but it's not it's they're not able to do everything right but so the way that things are pronounced the way that uh which uh, verbiage is used which conjugations are used which uh names of things right so coche is used in guatemala to the best of my knowledge whereas caro is used in nicaragua and auto is used in argentina um they duolingo uses coche at least the majority of the time i know they try to mix in other things very confusingly without telling you and uh uh, you're you're going to find just all those things super, super simple in Guatemala. They also don't speak all that fast, so that's beneficial as well. That's one of the reasons why. Just go out to a restaurant, and, and easily you're going to be like, this is the easiest Spanish-speaking experience I've ever had. You go to another country, and you'll start feeling your, your own level of Spanish just getting less and less as you try to interact with someplace that isn't Guatemala. And then finally, and this is really important, because of these other factors, Guatemala has built a tourism industry around language learning. So the number of Spanish schools, their accessibility, how easy they are to find, how broadly available they are, is pretty much unmatched. Uh, it, to my knowledge, they are number one. So if you're looking to find those resources, they're going to have them all over the place. Uh, it's going to be much more established and, and just a lot more resources. So it's going to make it the easiest for you to do. So uh, that's the question that I got. And uh, hopefully that's useful. I don't want to dissuade people from coming to Nicaragua. Obviously, if you want to come down here and look for a language school or a language tutor, I'm just going to spend time with you. That's going to work out great. Don't think that that's a problem at all. But if, uh, if, if your goal is purely to learn a universal Spanish and you have no other considerations, strongly consider Guatemala. It is almost certainly going to be the best choice based on that. But wherever you're planning on living, if that's the thing you want to do, you're going to want to learn there because every country has its nuances. And the earlier you start learning those slang terms and, and local phrases, colloquialisms, and influences from other languages, the easier it's going to be. If you're living in Bolivia, for example, they have a lot of influence from the indigenous Indigenous languages in the area. Nicaragua has quite a bit from Nahuatl here in the region. In fact, we're just outside a Nahuatl zone. And so we have lots of names and place names and, and words for things that are different than in much of the Spanish speaking world because we have these Nahuatl influences. And sometimes there's a lot, there's words that have options from Nahuatl and options from Spanish. And up here, we tend to lean towards the Nahuatl options. And in other parts, they lean towards the traditional Spanish options. And while both are correct and pretty well known, what you use in day-to-day -day life will be based mostly on where you learn those words. So learning them in a place where uh, it's it's whatever you're going to use the most long-term is probably going to be the easiest for you. Anyway, thanks for joining me. Like and subscribe. If you'd like to join our member group, it has no special perks, but it is pretty cool that you're able to support the channel. So look for that button. It says join. Feel free. We got a couple people who signed up and I really appreciate you guys. It means a lot how much support we get here. If you'd like to help support the channel in a general sense, you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller. It comes straight to me. It's like Patreon and helps with all the things we need to do here. As always, hit that like, subscribe, tell someone about the show, and I will see all of you manana.